Welcome to the Metal Zone Podcast. This is episode 29 from February 2nd, 2020. I'm Tom. And I'm Stefan. And on today's epi episode, Tom talks about his Shaper Origin, a, held, a handheld CNC router. Uh, I talk a little bit about that I want to get back into filament making and what things I purchased to shred my materials and make my filament extruder work properly again um, on news. The new Elegoo Mars Pro has been with reviewers for a couple of weeks, but it doesn't seem to be available somewhere to purchase. And yeah, we talk about why they are doing the same thing again as they already did with the normal Elegoo Mars. Uh, MakerBot announced that they are introducing a new 3D printer into the education market. And we take a look at the teaser and, uh, well, talk about what it might be. And I hope that Thingiverse is going to be better again after that. We're all, we're all hoping for that. <laughs> Let's see if it comes true. As an unplanned video topic today, uh, we, we, we kind of sidetrack on to the Linus Tech Tips stream, the I'm thinking about retiring one, and how we may or may not be thinking about at least not doing all the things ourselves that we've been doing on these channels and, and how we can partially require, uh, re require retire from video production. Uh, and yeah, we, we skip right over the topic of the week because it's just, we've got so much to, to talk about anyways. Um, and we land right at the questions. So um, one that's always coming up is uh, FEA simulation for 3D printed parts, ins and outs, the what can we do, what can we not do with today's tools for resin, laser, melting, and FDM. Um, also, there is a servo in an EMA 17 compatible size, uh, the MKS Servo 42B. We touch on the ins and outs of servos and you know what a brushless, what a real brushless servo would do versus a separate servo and whether it actually makes a difference for a 3D printer. And then for the last set of questions, well, I guess for, for the last single question, um, for which is a, a follow-up of the foaming PLA, uh, from the last episode, can you use modifiers, for example, in Prusa Slicer to do a non-foamed or a more rigid version of that foaming PLA um, inside a foam structure? So Tom, you just, well, recently got back from a training using the, the, the shaper, the like handheld CNC router. Uh, actually, oh. it's not called the Shaper. <laughs> it's called the Origin. Shaper is the company, but yes. Okay. <laughs> Just wanted to have that actually moment in there. Uh, YouTube viewers, you guys get to see it. Uh, everyone else is going to have to look at what the Shaper looks like. But Shaper, yeah, they they, they gave me one. <laughs> they oh. gave me one to try out. This is like one of those uh, review loaner units. And I've not tried it yet. It's still got the original seal on the screen. Uh, I really, really envy you. I've I've seen the machine like uh, for the last two years on tested and Jimmy DiResta and whatever on uh, the Lord of Comfort's one two yeah American YouTube channels and yeah it, it wasn't sold before in in Europe and so they are now finally starting They're to sell just it here now launching the sale yeah so the the workshop that i that i went to um which by the way was was uh, usually a paid workshop that carpenters and and artists that use the shaper go to um they invited me to come over i didn't pay for it they also gave me a review sample you know the influencer perks <laughs> <You know? laughs> um but yeah so the, the, i think the they, they had a few machines there that they gave to the people that the people could take home and that was actually the machines that they had ordered so mm. i think right now they're, they're giving out or giving out there they're sending out the first machines uh that people are, are buying in europe so yeah there were a bunch of of modifications to it that, to make it appropriate for the european market ce all the certifications you guys are, are familiar with that um but yeah i got to use it for a day under supervision uh, <laughs> And now I have one here and I've already, you know, just having a machine, <laughs> ideas pile up. But for, for, for everyone who's not familiar with the Shaper, um, 
Shivan, you, you know what this thing does roughly, right? I have seen what it does and it was always really intriguing to see. But yeah, maybe maybe explain how that works and why I called it like a handheld CNC router. It's I, I don't think they have a good name for it because it's 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 weird. It's it's not actually well, it is CNC, but it's also it's a combined Unit. So essentially, um, I'm just going to hold this into the camera, but I'm, I'm going to try to explain it as, as best as I can. It's a router, basically, that you hold. It's got a, it's got a little trim router spindle in there. Um, it looks like a, a manual router, but it's got a screen up there that right now still has the protective film on it. Um, and as you drag this thing across your workpiece, you're not setting up fences, you're not setting up guides or anything. You're just putting down the shaper tape which this thing picks up with the camera on the back where my nose is pointing um, and the camera actually reads where the tool is so you just move it across your workpiece and it automatically detects where it is and you're basically you're milling out what you program on the screen or you're routing out um, so it's got a, a like a, a 2d drawing tool even built in you can also export or import your your svg files um, and they've also got a thing where it's like a community thing in there, which is nice. And basically you program what do you want to, to mill, to cut out. You see it on, on, a, on a 2D scan of your workpiece. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can lay it out. And then as you move across uh, your cut lines, it corrects for mistakes you make. So it's got, it's actually got a, a, a quite decent correction range. Um, so I think this is like, an inch of travel, mm -hmm. roughly, in XY. Um, Two-ish centimeters or so, official specs are in there. But it's more than enough for you to to drag the tool along and to, to have it stay perfectly on the line of what you want to cut. So basically, it's, it's, a, well, it's a 2D... I don't want to say 2.5D, but that because that gets tricky because you you actually need to have the um, the router plate resting on a workpiece so you can't mill out like a pocket and then you know, go deeper in there, that doesn't, mm -hmm. usually doesn't work unless it's a small pocket because the base is pretty large. Um, so it's, 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 it's an interesting like middle ground between a conventional router and a full on CNC router table because you're not limited in size with this thing when the showcase they're always showing is like a um musical notes inlays across an entire room mm -hmm. that they that they're shapering out shape 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 routing out <laughs> hashtag shaper made uh, <laughs> so you're not you're not limited in, in size but they're also showing um that you can do pcbs with this thing cool. which people have already commented like that's that's the worst way of of making a pcb but <laughs> hey it, if you if you gotta make do with what you have like if you just happen to have a two and a half grand shaper then you can also do pcbs it's more of a showcase what would right? be a perfect clickbaity youtube video title <laughs> <laughs> yeah making pcbs on the shaper the worst um, way to make a pcb oh, yeah no. it, it, that's really cool so um even though it's only tracking with the cameras you still get like tenth of a millimeter accuracy with it Somewhere in in that range. Now, in the in the workshop, um, again, me using it for like the second time ever, um, I did get some overshooting corners. Like if you have a square mm -hmm. cutout, you, you get some some bounce, some overshoot. I don't know if that w was just me kind of pulling too much or, or pulling too much when the pressure stops because the the tool tries to stop cutting and then yeah. you, you still have the same force on it. Yeah. Not sure if that was just me, but that that was the one artifact I was seeing. Um, but for example, inlays where you cut out a pocket and then you cut out an inlay that fits into that pocket, mm -hmm. those fit very, very well. Cool. Um, I probably a tenth of a millimeter. Yeah. So they they had some hardwood pieces that that we could cut. Um, so not like software that you can just smush in mm -hmm. there. Um, actual stuff that needs to be precise, and that works well. Works well. So I'm probably not the the, the audience for this thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, because my I don't know. I would I I would be interested in that, and I, if I would not have that much work, or if if I would have spare time, I might be tempted to to buy one of those because I think it can be handy from time to time. 
This thing is super shippable. Like, just let me know if you want to borrow it. I can <laughs> ship it over there. You need to try it out on your own at first. So uh, basically, it's a 2,500 euros, dollars, whatever money units. Money units, yeah. Money units machine. And then you ha also have the the sticky tape with kind of like the dot pattern on it that it use for, uses for tracking. Yeah, I, I don't want to dig through the box right now. Yeah. So yeah, you get, you get uh, a... Fairly long roll of of the patterned tape, and I think it's mm -hmm. a it's a unique pattern all the way through. So it's like dominoes, um, yeah. basically, that that all, each have a unique uh, pattern. So that is the, there's actually two ways to use that. One, if you have like a sheet of plywood and you want to route out like a whatever something out of that sheet of plywood itself, then you just put it over that that plywood and you cut through it, and then it's it's done for you. Pull it off once you're done. But you can also make yourself jigs um, and mm, just yeah. put the tape on the jig itself. So if, you, if you're always making uh, stuff out of like a 20 by 20 centimeter mm. piece of, of, of wood, you put that piece of wood in your jig, you put the tape around mm. it, and then you can keep using the, the tape for however long you want. Okay. Um, they're also showing that, that jig set up for doing like end grain milling. Mm -hmm. Like um, not just doing flat pieces of, of wood, but actually yeah. mounting it vertically and then doing like... Um, What's it called? Joinery, joints. Yeah. Um, you can do finger joints and, and all sorts of fancy Japanese named uh, joint shapes <laughs> uh, with the shaper. And, and for that, you also have like a vertical, again, you have that, that vertical clamping setup and you put the tape on that mm. vertical clamp. So you, you don't actually yeah. consume it. Yeah. The tape that's included, there's two rolls included. I think each roll is uh, good for three sheets of plywood. Okay. It's 18 bucks. It's a consumable. Yeah, it costs money. It's not super expensive in my opinion. You obviously pay more for wood finish than for tape. Mm -hmm. um, or you, you probably pay more for sandpaper than you do for the tape. So <laughs> it's not that big of a deal. It is, yeah, it is a consumable. But it really allows like carpenters to do things they, they wouldn't have been able to do before without a CNC router. Or let me put it well, this way. Um, easier because there's always a way to do it by hand but but this might allow you to do pretty neat things pretty neat cutouts and tables and stuff like that uh, yeah. which wasn't possible before in an easy way i i don't think there's anything that the origin can do that you cannot do with a traditional router and like a, a follower bit or something yeah um oof. yeah but then you have to make your jig somehow your, mm. your, your templates um so it's a it's a different way of working and like if you compare it to a to a router to to a full-on mm. cnc router that fits a full sheet of plywood that thing is big like yeah. it, it takes up space in in a shop and usually people start using it as a workbench and, and dump stuff on it uh the shape you just take out and you, you use it where you are so you, you use it on your sheet of plywood or you can use it on a job um basically just bring it as a tool and you can just put some some plywood or um, or stuff on some Holzbrücke, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, route stuff out there or route out uh, pieces on the floor or in the or wh wherever. I think that that's the that's the big advantage that the that the shaper has, the origin has, <laughs> the shaper ecosystem of tools has. <laughs> <laughs> does it do aluminum? Ah uh, yes, yes, yes. The question of questions. Uh, question. Yes, it does. It, it it does do aluminum. Okay. Um, they did put a pretty big asterisk behind that um, because you're not going to be using any uh, any cool any liquid cooling. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it? Coolant. Coolant. Mist cooling. Coolant in there. Uh, it does have a, a vacuum attachment, so you do get some airflow and you do get some mm. chip evacuation, but you don't get that much. Um, yeah, you, you don't get flux cooling. You don't get um, chip evacuation that well. Uh, they do have an eighth inch collet, so you can use your eighth inch tools. Eighth which is inch is me. six point three five. Uh, uh, no, it's one seven five. Okay, uh, that's pretty small. That's like your, your standard micro cutters that you use on. Okay basically all the small cncs okay um and you can get you can get those in, in high quality low quality any shape you want so that's that's good um yeah i probably wouldn't put like a one millimeter bit in there and try to to micro machine stuff <laughs> i'm still gonna do it i'm still gonna try it um <laughs> because it's, it's just interesting but yeah it it does do aluminum cool 
technically with limitations yeah um and also the, the entire thing of oh you, you still have to you still have to use the tool you still have to scoot it across your work piece mm. um that's something that yes is something you might enjoy because it it, it still keeps you connected with the mm. part you make um but it's also if you're doing like the same thing if, if you're making just a batch of, of the same parts it can get tedious because you're still like routing out the same shape over and over mm. and you have to be there unless or unlike with a, with a cnc router that's just okay does it without you and user interface and everything is it really straightforward to use or is it something where you said oh i would have preferred to do like the the work on a pc and then just send it to the shaper so yeah that that's one of the one of the good things that you can that that i, that I do enjoy about the machine i know i'm, I'm sounding like a, a show for shaper but uh <laughs> I'm, I'm excited about this tool it's i know it's not for everyone and i know some people are going to say well two and a half grand are you crazy no but um you so far in the workshop and i think for for most of what i'm going to be using the shape before i'm not going to be using a pc at all there's no cam you do the cam on the mm -hmm. machine itself you load in an svg or you draw your paths and then for example you have a box you say okay this is going to be an inside outside on the line cut there's going to be a pocket um you said how deep that's all happening on the machine itself mm -hmm. um so it it cuts out it cuts out cam so you don't need to learn uh, ESTL cam, Fusion, whatever other cam software on top. You don't need to learn CAD uh, to design your parts unless you want to do like 2D drawings, but you can do mm. that in, in Illustrator or whatever. Um, yeah, it, it's it's a lot easier and quicker to use than a CNC, I think. Mm. Cool. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to what you come up with. So, Yeah, I've already got some, some projects planned. Like I, I drilled through... <laughs> <laughs> to a brand new desk <laughs> uh trying to mount some uh some what did i mount uh whatever drilled into the bottom of of the desk and was like whoops i'm through so now there's a there's, there's a five millimeter hole there i'm gonna make an inlay for that uh just but, because i can yeah well you you haven't worked with it a ton but for example if you have a desk how hard is it to align your like your tool paths with an existing table that is perpendicular trivial, trivial. so you can do i i see we're talking a lot about the shaper today that's yeah. why we, we don't have a topic of the week <laughs> uh, <laughs> because i also wanted to have one for years <laughs> uh, I, i i guess you're just gonna have to come over and, and try yeah, it then. I, i need to come over at some point um yeah so there are a few different ways to to align it so because it has that camera built in it actually gives you a full 2d mapped uh image of mm. your workpiece that you can work on so if you see that hole you can just you can literally line up uh your cutting paths with with whatever you have if you have knots in your wood that you want to cut out and then yeah. put an inlay over it you can just do that by eye but if you have a square workpiece like a sheet of plywood or something what you can also do is put in your router bit It's uh, by default, it's an eight millimeter collet on this one. I'm not sure what the US size ships with um, or the US machine ships with. And you basically do your scan and then you say, okay, I'm going to butt it up against the edge of my workpiece <sighs> on one, two points. That's going to define okay. the front and then once on the side. Okay. And then I have a grid that is pretty much perfectly perpendicular to your, your workpiece. So included touch off probe. Yeah, sure. Cool. It also oh. does touch off for tool height. Okay. It just runs down, goes up, boop, and <laughs> it actually, that's actually one, one really smart thing. So they've got a, a pressure plate on the bottom okay. here. So on the router table, you it's just spring-loaded enough that mm. where you have the weight of the tool resting against the table, it's pressed down and it's flush. But as soon as the router moves down enough, it actually lifts the entire machine up and tilts it back, mm. and that's, that gets detected. So it, tool height, automatic, built-in, works well. Maybe cool. for engravers, that's... Uh, You, you do need to do it on a hard surface, but it does work for engravers, they're including one. Okay. <laughs> cool. One last question. Um, <laughs> uh, just more or less a trivial trivial one. You said that it comes in a Festool box. Is it just a Festool shape box or is Festool actually, are they the guys who will be reselling the unit? So 
yeah, uh, Fest Tool Sustainer. I'm not sure if this is actually the Fest Tool Sustainer, uh, to be honest. Uh, it's a T Lock Sustainer, literally called Sustainer. Oh, I've never seen that. But that's actually a brand name. Okay. Uh, by Thanos Game BH. So it comes in this box. Uh, Shaper are owned by Festool now. They used to be their own Silicon Valley startup. Okay. Um, they are part of the, well, not, not Festool. Um, Festool is, is just another brand of the tool company agglomeration that mm. that is um th there's a parent company which you're probably googling right now yeah um that owns festival and a bunch of other brands that you probably have heard of and shaper is just part of that brand family now um which means uh, i think the spindle is uh not directly out of the the festool uh lineup of machines but it is definitely using festool components in there okay cool yeah, I'm really I looking forward the, the, to the collets are a festival size okay. or something. <laughs> I might be wrong. <laughs> uh, okay, cool. Yeah, really looking forward to see what you come up with. It's, yeah, uh, it's you. You have to you have to use it yourself to understand what what like the feeling of using mm. the machine is because it, it is nothing like doing manual routing or. CNC routing is mm. it's somewhere in between and it's it's really it's really spacey to 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 feel the machine correcting for yeah. you being a human. It's it's nice. Cool. It's nice. Yeah. We'll see. <laughs> Stefan, back back to you. Back I, I feel like I've been talking too much already. <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, totally fresh fine. coffee. Fresh coffee. Oh. <laughs> um Back to filament making back for to, you. Back to filament making, yeah. So, yeah, still my my most popular video, I, th I think, which almost has 2 million views, uh, was about filament making, recycling old filament and prints and making new filament out of it. Um, I did that like one and a half years ago. It was kind of the point where my channel really started to grow. But I never came back to that topic. Um, I s continued a little bit working on it, but I and I also did like um, I, I made myself a palletizer to um, do like a really rough filament in the first run with all of the scraps and then cut it down to small chunks, which right. are uniformly sized, and then using those pellets to extrude the final filament in the end. Um, yeah. I did work on that a little bit but but not too much and uh i somehow w want to get back to filament making and just like playing around with it and i have been gathering plastic bottles and lids and stuff <laughs> like that over the last years because in germany <laughs> it's not so easy to get uh normal pet bottles because uh they all well most of them have a two uh 25 cents <sighs> not security deposits what's well, fun yeah a, a deposit i guess a deposit yeah, yeah. so um s not not similar to to other countries we need to carry our pet bottles back to the shop otherwise uh we pay 25 cents extra so yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you get like like what 50 grams of, of pet PTG, PT out of it at most? No, it's 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 way less. It's, less? it's just like oh. ten or fifteen grams. It's it's minimal. Oh uh, yeah, right. The uh the the non reusable ones, those yeah. are really thin walled. Yeah. The Mervik, the multi I don't know. Um U U US doesn't have anything that gets recycled. <laughs> <laughs> so I I really want to try out making filament out of that. So yeah, I, I purchased some things to get back into it and i ordered a a plastic shredder so a plastic shredder from uh precious plastics the precious plastics project so right, so that they're they're also doing filament recycling basically well this is an open source project that is all involved with plastics recycling and stuff like that so they have a full open source range of um plastic shredders extruders uh injection molding machines and stuff like that and there's also like a bazaar where um you as yourself can use the plants and produce those parts for others that are interested in 
Right. Things like that. So, yeah, I uh, I uh, ordered a, a shredder without the motor so far because I hope I can put a really big hand crank uh, on it. <laughs> I don't know. If how, that... how are you going to get consistent flow? Well, it, it doesn't. Well, it doesn't matter for the shredder because I just want to shred oh. my plastic. Uh, oh, the, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For the extruder, it's something still. different. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. But um, so I wanted to to buy one of those for ages, but they are just so big, and I have so little space down in my basement that I just never purchased one. So now it's just like more or less shoe size, shoe box sized, a shoe box sized shredder. And I hopefully can use it to some extent with a big hand crank to shred my materials and uh, yeah, cut them down to pieces and then recycle it in my in my fill extruder, which I also hope to upgrade with a little bit more beefy motor that I purchased. We'll see. Okay. We'll see. Um, I, I tried lots of different techniques techniques for shredding plastics, all from like blenders to paper shredders and 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 other stuff but nothing really worked properly and just i just came to the point where okay i think there is no way getting around buying a proper one yeah we'll see i hope it will arrive at some point during the next weeks and um yeah i can play a little bit around with that and see if i can make my own pet filament yeah. Have you looked into getting like uh, the industrially shredded uh, or, or recycled uh, plastics? Because you can buy those for actually fairly cheap yeah. uh, in bulk. Just get like a big bag of yeah. a thousand kilos of, of plastic that is either fully recycled or just partially yeah. recycled. And it's already pelletized for the most part, I think. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so I know a guy who has an injection molding company. And he does that with all of the scraps that he has. And he has tons of that. And he's also partly using it and partly selling it. Um, but the thing is, for me, it was interesting to really do like the whole process chain from right. taking my own material, shredding my own material, and then make a new filament out of it. Um, it would work. I guess, but I think that's just half the fun. It's it's uh, it's not as interesting of a video. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you you're really doing the these strange parts approach where you're sourcing everything. Now, what was it? Strange parts? Who who was the guy who did the uh, like iPhone from scratch, mining yeah. everything? Stranger oh. parts, stranger things, stranger stranger things is, is, is strange. Is, yeah, yeah, no, that's a that's a that's series, a TV series. series. Uh, strange parts is is a channel. Um, but I'm not sure if that's the one who did like everything the iPhone. Yeah, he did the iPhone. Yeah. Oh well, um, we'll see. Yeah, recycling PTG. Are you also going to grind down some of your prints and try and uh, recycle the, the PLA in those? Yes, definitely. Because yeah. I have a ton. Well, I already gave like I think my my whole collection of of last year away to a student company here in germany they're called uh, qi tech uh, and they started as a student project recycling scraps and making phone cases and stuff like that out of it and they right. just got in touch with me and asked me oh, do you have some pla scraps around and i said yeah i was collecting those for <laughs> ages uh, i'm quite happy to give them away at the moment but yeah well, yeah, from all of the I'd, filament tests, I still have most of the stuff right here. And it would just be interesting to put everything in the grinder and make new filament out of it, even though it's not worth my while. But I'm interested in that. And maybe somebody else is inspired to, uh, well, do it in, in, in a bigger scale. Yeah, if it if it pushes the uh, the industry forward and and allow someone else to or at least inspire someone else to do it, that's a that's a good thing. Now, from from what I've seen in in previous attempts where somebody tried to commercialize three uh, D printing recycling, it was always the the issue that are my parts clean? Are they pure? As in, is it just the PLA, mm -hmm. or is it contaminated with ABS or whatever additives that the manufacturer may put in? And in the end, really, what you can make is like black filament. Yeah, uh, that's like eighty percent as strong as virgin stuff because it's uh, it's it's degraded with additives and, and stuff mixed in. So it's it's really more of a of a 
downcycling process in a way. But for, for many things, it might be fine if you have a, a filament mm. that's just a lot cheaper. Maybe if yeah. it's cheaper, I don't know. But the thing um, is, if you can yeah. get a roll of pil- of filament, uh, a roll of PLA <laughs> for 10, 15 euros a kilogram, um, if, oh, I don't know if recycling material is really worthwhile. Well, we had the... Or competitive. I don't know if, I don't know if that uh, PLA shortage has subsided yet. Yeah. Um, and that might be a real world, world yeah. incentive to start <laughs> recycling and reusing more of, of the old plastics. We we're sitting all on gold. All on yeah. gold. <laughs> if you literally can't buy it, then... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. Cool. So... On the... Yeah, yeah on, the, on, the, on the topic of not being able to buy things... <laughs> let's let's move this topic up uh news news availability of the elegoo mars pro god damn it guys um i guess i guess the entire china health situation isn't isn't helping but um have you been following the the elegoo products and launches at all i have an elegoo mars at home right. didn't use it that much so far but Besides that, I'm currently not, still not the hugest fan of, of resin 3D printing. So you're, you're probably more, more into that now. So yeah, tell me the story. Right. Uh, so story from, from my perspective, the story. Story time, guys. <laughs> so Elegoo launched their Mars a year ago or so. It, it wasn't that long ago. Mm. And for months, you couldn't buy it. Like immediately as soon as, as like one or two units showed up on, I think Amazon Spain or somewhere had it. Okay. N- none of the other Amazons had it. Um, it, you know, it was available there for half a day and then it was sold, sold out again. And I, I still remember myself and Joel and others posting about, hey, I found this, um, this, this, this Mars listed on Amazon. It, it seems to be available. Of course, we're posting that stuff because it's affiliate links because we're making money from it um but i still remember you know that being a thing posting like hey we found mars's in stock um and it appears that the same thing is happening with the mars pro again like Mm -hmm. they've sent me a machine uh probably six weeks ago now where they were like okay we're gonna launch it in january sometime and I've been waiting week after week after week trying to live unbox it because I'm not going to unbox a machine that you can't buy. That's not, I'm not going to, you know, unbox vaporware at this point. Uh, and it seems like now there's finally, it's finally quote unquote available. Um, if you search on it for Amazon, it's, it's, it doesn't exist. Um, if you look it up on my mini factor, which apparently have a, either an exclusive edition or Mm. something there uh it's also not available um but elgu actually started posting amazon links on their twitter to all the (laughs) european amazons um which i I guess are affiliate links too which is which is always weird manufacturers posting affiliate links (laughs) to their own products but whatever um and none of those are available so it's now, I guess, listed on Amazon, but it's hidden on Amazon and it's not available on Amazon. So it's still like nothing has changed. It's just that the Arctic article listing is there. So is this a product that that has launched? Is this a product that, you know, just doesn't exist, that, 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 that doesn't get produced? Is it a product that gets sold out so quickly that nobody can ever buy it for real? So mm-hmm. I don't know what's going on there. Well, it seems like they they're doing the approach... Um manufacturing them don't putting them on on stock before the launch and then just shipping like one or two to each amazon i don't know each each country that has has amazon and uh yeah then they're directly sold out and it it takes ages until they they get a new stock and other manufacturers usually stockpile hundreds thousands sometimes millions of products that as soon as the product launches they are able to uh, meet the demand and uh, something seems to be wrong i don't know if they have problem with production or if it's just get them out of the factory as soon as possible in order to make money 
Yeah, so this this paper launch uh, approach is something that has been f widespread in the um, like computer market, graphics cards and CPUs for, for a few years. I think it's just now getting toned down a bit, but for a while, for example, I, I don't know if it was the 900 series of NVIDIA GPUs or, or some, some GPUs, basically, they would be announced, or CPUs, I don't know, they would be announced and I th oh no, 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 Intel, Skylake. Yeah, those were sold out for like three months after launch. <laughs> um, basically, a manufacturer would announce a product. People would, would get hyped about it because it's the next big thing. But nobody could verify how good it was because it, it didn't exist outside of, of uh, a few golden samples sent out to, to reviewers and influencers. Um, and basically all they were doing were that they, they were they had all the time in the world to spin up manufacturing and or to to ramp up manufacturing uh, while nobody was buying like the competitors parts because everyone is, is waiting for that one supposedly <laughs> magic uh, product coming out so I feel it's the same thing for with the with the Mars Pro right now where really all they're doing is is hurting the competition while everyone is waiting for the for the Mars Pro uh, to finally be available, oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, that that kind of sucks. Yeah. Um, now, of course, what um, what Prusa and E3D have done with their recent launches, with the Prusa Mini and the E3D Hemera, um, I still need to make myself say the, the, the proper name for that. <laughs> uh, so E3D, I know, have stockpiled hard before they, they actually made it available. Mm -hmm. um, so on launch day, on the official launch day, they had at least a few thousand units uh, that were ready to ship. Um, of course, for them, that kind of backfired a bit because many of the units had an issue with that gear that was just mm -hmm. pressed on a bit too tightly. Uh, I think we've covered that mm -hmm. uh, in the last episode. And Prusa with the um, encoder. And Prusa with the encoder, which one? The... the For the Prusa Mini, I think there was a problem with the encoder wheel. Okay, I did not follow that. Huh? <laughs> the, the, okay, well, but yeah, yeah. Um, while well, you looked it up. Um, so yeah, uh, E3D were stockpiling, Prusa were stockpiling with the Mini as well. And Prusa actually have not sent out mini review samples yet, I think. They, they were like, okay, if you want to buy it, you can buy it. But it's going to be shipped in like March or something. Um so they're they're also taking the we're just gonna take it easy on marketing before we have any any proper stock built up and i I respect that of course I would want to be in on that uh, on that in initial launch review mm -hmm. as a you know as a youtube dude that's that's what you kind of want you don't want to be four months late like I was with the we're half a year a year late like I was with the SO one like nobody cares about that review now anymore <laughs> um it's actually been one of my worst performing videos in, in recent history <laughs> just no nobody cares about a product that's been out for so long but and it's not have, that but there weren't as revolutionary as the mark any proper reviews yeah. from the bigger youtubers around for the SL one because they were only shipping out review units like at the end of last year. So yep. it's kind of weird. Well, it, it, it's it's a more expensive product. So, but sorry, don't want to. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. It, it sucks for me as a, as a person who is interested in having like day one reviews of final hardware. But on mm. the other hand, like I would rather review like finished hardware. Mm -hmm. then having to deal with pre-release stuff which mm -hmm. i always decline when when somebody's like hey we're we've just got our beta unit so you want to try it we're going to release it in three months i'm like no nope, please send me <laughs> send me a unit once it's once it's finished <laughs> uh so yeah the, i don't I'm, I'm at this point i'm just getting frustrated with elegoo because it's it's not the first time they've done this yeah also their um their their plastic vats still kind of aren't available that okay. they've that they shipped me uh, a sample unit of a few months ago it's they, they're they just announcing products and they're not selling them okay yeah because i actually wanted to buy <laughs> some of those plastic vats but wasn't able to get any on on amazon for every time i checked yeah yeah well <sighs> i don't know um if it's not hurting them uh they're probably gonna continue doing that. I don't know if if that's gonna gonna be real bad reputation, but no. Nah. I don't know if, if me ranting about it is is gonna make any 
the impact at all. <laughs> but Grand. like I said, I'm, yeah. I'm just I'm just getting frustrated with that. Like I've got this product that that I've been planning to unbox for the last few weekends, and I've mm. always a few days before before you know the Sunday stream mm. date, I would check, hey, is this available yet? And it's just it doesn't exist and there's no communication on what's actually going going on did you talk to them and ask them why there isn't any stock available i i think they're all on on vacation right now okay uh, chinese new year is still going on and it's been extended uh till february 10th i think mm. so yeah i i still need to get in touch directly with them but yeah it's just no communication man yeah. <laughs> No stock. I, I mean, if if they're if they're really selling all the units they're making, if they're running full tilt on production and they're making a thousand units a day and they're selling all of them, mm -hmm. then good on them. But I don't think that's what's happening. Well, all right. Um, rotary encoders. <laughs> yes. A rotary. So there is a Prusa blog post. Um, about the recap for 2019 and one section of that is rotary encoders on the lcd panel are the first on the list we 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 register oh, can't talk we register a slightly larger than average fail rate on these components so yeah they supposedly had issues and they are shipping out replacement lcd encoder switch um, units to the ones that have issue issues but yeah that's that's also the thing if you prepare a really big stockpile and all of those parts have a problem because nobody's testing them or new but nobody's using them there is a risk involved with that e3d had well, to deal even with if it. you even if you do test all of them and i think the uh well i've seen the pressure assembly lines and every machine is tested uh as to to their best capacity but if it's something that happens after i don't know two and a half thousand spin cycles on the encoder or just you know you know how that curve looks it's always it's not yeah. always exactly there but it's it's just during the life of the product that is more likely to fail you can't you, you'd have to do a hundred percent test to mm -hmm. to catch all those it's you can if if you're just doing a partial test on on, on them and doing some real wear testing yeah you might catch some yeah but you're not going to catch all issues yeah. so you're right there and the mini is still on back order so even though they stockpiled plenty of units <laughs> uh, well recent recent orders will not be shipped before april or may this year so yeah there is quite a high high demand for that and yeah. so you I also mean, it's, it's it's been on april back order for a while mm. so uh what were you gonna yeah. say you also you also still don't have one you also just no no yeah. no, no. They, they they specifically said like hey we're, we're gonna ship all the pre-orders first and then we can mm. talk about sending you one for review and um three make a noob actually did the smart thing on earth before before i, I think before the show opened and it was officially announced he, he saw <laughs> oh it's it's available on the shop now and he bought it he just straight up <laughs> ordered one and he's he, he already has his yeah. i think uh and for me now there's there's just no way of getting it like in in any decent uh, in any decent time frame <laughs> so. well and it's um. probably also well it depends it's probably also better for you if you do the review and at that point you don't have to wait two three four months uh when ordering a unit because that will scare potential buyers off so might also be a win for you we'll see yeah. we'll see all right you've got another topic plopped down into our agenda makerbot education yeah makerbots supposedly well probably this news will already be um i'm not missing the word again not outdated uh, it will probably be already outdated, yeah, outdated at the point when okay. you're listening because yeah two days from now the day of recording uh makerbot will be releasing or at least um showing their new educational printer so there wasn't actually that much available by by MakerBot for the educational market over the last years. I think it was just the um, it was the Replicator Educa Educators Edition, which was a five thousand dollar 
3D printer that was aimed at the educational market. Um, and it what, seems what actually makes a what makes a 3D printer educational? Uh, foolproof. I don't know. Um, Why do you need a, a specific edition for that? I don't know. <laughs> shouldn't shouldn't the base machine be foolproof too? Uh, like, okay, wh whatever. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> additional safety precautions i don't know Just what what is actually because schools are, are yeah yeah you, you can milk schools a bit more than you can uh, like the private customer i guess probably so uh yeah there was a <laughs> youtube video released a couple of days ago and it doesn't show the unit itself it's just a teaser for what's teaser, coming yeah and uh well people have been looking at the video and it seems as the printer they are showing off looks like a flash forward adventure 3 maybe with just like a makerbot logo on the side or something like that which is a 400 dollar 3d printer at the moment i think so i'm really excited to see <laughs> what they're going to come up with what's the product gonna sell for and uh if it is something really new and useful or if it's just like trying to get into a niche or yeah in like a sector where you could potentially make more money with at least a little bit cheaper 3d printer in comparison to the five thousand yeah. dollar uh makerbot replicator educators edition I mean, what what MakerBot has always done is to prepare some curricula, uh, curricula, curricul curriculum, curriculum, yeah, whatever. Um, multiple curric. I don't even know what's going to Okay, whatever. <laughs> they've had those. They've had uh, teaching material with their printers that I maybe was a premium purchase or something. I don't know, but they they had that prepared for educators to use and to to kind of go through their their classes and 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 follow. Uh, that as a as a guideline and as a basic okay we're going to start with this and go there, there, there. Um, so really the machine itself is is kind of second nature in that or, or secondary importance in, in that it's really mm -hmm. the the educational material that you get and and the the way of teaching things mm -hmm. um the way of of, of uh, working through the process and, and and yeah you guys know how education works uh I think that that is that is much more important in an educational product than the hardware itself. As long as the hardware works, mm. like what's the, as long as it's it's foolproof enough uh, for a teacher and, and student combination to to make it work in the in the classroom, then it should be fine. Yeah. Now for that for that adventure three looking machine, do you think it's actually a, just a straight up? rebrand, or are they cloning the machine, or what's it, it looks like? What's your take there? It doesn't look like, I think, like 100% of a copy. Maybe they're adding additional filters. Maybe they are tweaking, like, the user interface and stuff like that. Um, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, there, there isn't that much to see on, on the video itself. So, All right. We'll see. The thing Positive I am really excited about is um, I still, like hope that maybe thingiverse will might become better and more stable at some point with like makerbot investing money in the non-professional market because they probably need uh. also a platform for models for this education problem uh, program so maybe they also invested a little in in, in thingiverse that the infrastructure is like working pro properly again at some point i don't know I, I i'd say don't get your hopes up um <laughs> because I, I think that the last thing you need in a, in, a, in a classroom setting is like unmoderated uh user generated content you might be right there. You might be right. So but what, what they're gonna have is is like a, a a library of parts that's included with with the curriculum. Uh, that would be my take because. Uh, well, well I think yeah. Go ahead. The the thing is, they have a big promo on the front page of Thingiverse, arriving February the fourth, twenty twenty. Well, they're, they're just using Thingiverse as a marketing platform. Yeah, like definitely. They always have. But there is 
also a Thingiverse education platform. I don't know how that differs from the like normal open Thingiverse. Maybe this is a little bit more moderated. I uh, ha- haven't gotten into that, but I, I, I still have the hope that they invest in the infrastructure because Thingiverse at the moment, well, Thingiverse for the last two years is just We're, horrible. Yeah. It's not like it's been getting better. It's actually been getting worse over time. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, Prusher printers do have an importer and I've, I've considered just running that over my, my Thingiverse library. Not that there's anything of value in there, but can't hurt. Can't hurt to have a, a second platform. Yeah. Uh, right now, if I, if I design something, I just post it to... Uh, what's the Ultimaker's? You imagine, okay. Uh, to you imagine, Prusa printers and Thingiverse just to have it, just to have it everywhere. Like I don't, I don't care where, where my files end up. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Thingiverse, eh, Thingiverse was nice because it was the first platform that allowed you to do something like sharing STLs in like a, a non-forum, in like an, an open way, where it's just like a a big repository of designs. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Have you ever found anything really? useful like the, the idea of okay you go in and you look for your washing machine replacement part and you get that exact knob that fits have you ever had that, yeah. that moment that yeah i did yeah i did multiple times and this is the thing i really like about thingiverse and like the the the, the community on there itself uh because with it growing and growing usually if i have a problem even with like the weirdest things um in many cases there have been other ones who also like solved that problem in the past it's not always perfect because not everyone has perfect cat skills but sometimes i find really good stuff and if i do things at home and they help me out i also usually post it to thingiverse because i i think it's it's a good thing having that it is for sure, for sure. For, for me, when I've I've kind of stopped looking for like real world solution parts on, on Thingiverse, just because there's so much uh, noise and and junk and unusable stuff on there as well. And and even if I find something that would solve my my one situation, my one problem, it it always had like one or two things wrong with it mm-hmm. where where I couldn't use it. This is the reason uh, why so I usually also po- post uh, step files or the Fusion three sixty files. Yeah. Yeah, if thingiverse. it's just the STL, like it's, you can import and edit, but it's a huge pain to do. Uh, yeah, I usually just design it myself. It's, it takes five minutes and it <laughs> gets me exactly what I want. Yeah, but not everyone has like really good cat skills as probably we do. So. Oh yeah, I'm I'm I'm, I'm an absolute cat god. <laughs> nothing nothing compares to what I can do. <laughs> yeah sure all right (laughs) no i i still have the hopes i still hope that at some day well at some point thingy worse is going to be better again i was fearing that it will shut down at some point but this is just giving me a glimpse of hope again i mean it would be stupid for makeup just to shut it down because it's it's such a hugely uh, popular platform it has so much content and value on there like The question is why they then didn't uh, sell it because it must be quite expensive Hmm. to run it on servers. And I think there might probably been other companies that that would have liked to invest in a platform like that and just put ads in there and stuff like that. I guess it's still a valuable marketing platform and advertising platform for makeup art itself. Mm. Like you, you're seeing the entire education thing right now is on the front page, I think. Yeah, it is. Or somewhere that there's always some makeup art ad on the front page. Yeah. I guess it's uh, it's it's still it's still working out for makeup art, yeah. so no reason to get rid of it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Then let's move on. I'm trying to 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 set markers here, but um I doubt we'll actually. We we really need to to switch our um our recording setup to to Reaper and what's the uh, plugin called? I don't know. There's really good software. We've talked about this. We should we should switch. Definitely. Might make uh might make the video portion. Well, it's not gonna make the video portion any easier, but it's it's certainly gonna make the the audio portion easier. So. Yeah, one, I, I think once I'm all settled in here in the studio, I I can start working on more. Uh, 
and more meta and, and process improvement projects yeah. again. And you listen, <clears throat> listeners and viewers out there might then at some point really find uh, chapter marks for oh, yeah. the for the podcast. Yeah, wouldn't that be something? <laughs> <laughs> it's probably going to reduce our, our watch time and listening time but yeah. oh yeah yeah oh no we, we wouldn't want that if the listeners are happy we can also going to be happy so <laughs> <laughs> no if our wallet's happy then then i'm happy yeah <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we care about you guys we, we we're, we're trying to get chapter marks in here but it's yeah. just there's there's no trivial way right now if we, if we did it it's a huge yeah. pain and it's not yeah whatever we've talked about this we really care about you especially because we kind of make no money with that podcast and we are still investing our time yeah, in it barely, so yeah. we do we do we also really like your feedback so hey uh on the um, let, let, me, let me sidetrack a bit here um are we just acting as oh we we care about you guys are we just uh you know make believe guys like some people say linus is have you seen the the linus uh live stream yes i have i'm thinking about retiring yeah uh i i reposted that on twitter i was like okay thanks linus for actually being human again because this is uh i i, I don't think it was like easy just going out there and saying hey uh, actually I, I i kind of think what i'm doing is is uh worthless in a while or just doesn't doesn't make much of a difference um so do do you still remember all the the points that he made um a couple but probably not all of them yeah so essentially for, for you guys who have not seen the uh the stream it was on the on the official uh, linus tech tips channel it was just linus with a crappy webcam and a crappy microphone just uh rambling for half an hour about you know what what his current situation in the linus media group and in life and in being a youtube creator is and it's it's actually touched a a few points that i that i can very much relate to like i i that that feeling of okay are you what you you you're putting out in content is that actually making a a proper difference to the world or is it just like feeding the machine again and i mean i've been i've been thinking about that too but in the end i was like okay it's I am providing value here. I'm, I'm hoping somehow. Mm. Um, I, I see that people are appreciating what I'm putting what I'm putting out there, and that's that makes a, a, a lot of a difference for me. Um, I don't know if you want to comment on 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 that in any way. <sighs> it's, it, it, it's the same for me because, uh, being honest, if you're not like a gigantic huge YouTuber, and with the education both of us. Uh, with the education we both have it would be way easier to make the same amount of money with way less effort in just like a, a normal company with a normal day job uh, we would have more spare time we might have more money we or at least equivalent um, so I'm, I'm doing that for the passion I'm doing that because I get the positive feedback by the viewers I am doing that because I think I can help people with with what I'm doing. I think I can um, really show show people my passion and maybe just get them more involved in 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 technical projects and and stuff like that. So that was always my goal, and as so, as long as I get this positive feedback and i still have the impression that people are appreciating what what i'm doing i still want to continue that um if at some point i get the impression that i'm only doing that for the money and don't really care what people well people don't really care what i'm doing and things like that i th i think that's that's going to be the point where you really need to think about Uh, quitting and stuff like that because as i said yeah i i would have the possibility to make more money with a normal day job it's just as it is um i i think linus has positioned himself very well here because he's i mean he's running he's ceo owner whatever of, of the linus media group it's not just linus tech tips and and luke you know helping him out and stuff it's what 22 people ish mm. uh in the entire operation so if linus wanted to quit right quit right now 
like he said in, in the in the live stream he could he could just walk away and and pretty much nothing would change um Linus Tech Tips would lose a host, but there are others to replace him. And the fact that he can take a vacation and 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 the company goes on, I think that's a that's a goal to hit. <laughs> mm. Because I don't think I I could do that right now. If, if I take a vacation, like nobody's producing videos, <laughs> channels that just not doing anything for those two weeks. Um. So yeah, the that's actually been one of my my motivations for for getting this studio is. Uh, just being able to to kind of professionalize the the video production workflow just just getting a bit more detached from the actual uh not the meat grinder the the, the grunt work of producing content um and actually being able to to experiment and to to do stuff again because that's 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 actually what's what's paining me the most about being a professional youtuber um and again using professional in the sense that it's my it's my job it's my uh it, it's a living that i make is i'm spending so much time on just all the, the meta and the video production and the you know scripting editing whatever all that 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 goes along just putting what i do on youtube that i don't really have that much time really experimenting and playing with the with the tools and the hardware again mm. um, or anymore so yeah, like I, I've been wanting to make a Marlin 2.0 guide. I've been wanting to to experiment more with that. I've I've also wanted to build a, a filament extruder because I've I've tried that six, seven, eight years ago, and it's somewhat worked already. Even on my, I think I paid I spent like two hundred bucks uh, back when I was a student. Um, I I do want to do those things, but I just don't have the time for it. But on this on the same hand, on the same token. I've not really had much of a life for the last few years um, because it's always just been, hey, you got to finish this script. You got to finish this video. I've, I've, you know, my hobby's been 3D printing and that was it. Uh, so really for me, it's 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 much of a, as much of a life work balance thing as it is a video production efficiency um, matter. Mm. Um, yeah, because I, I I think we're at the point where, where a lot of uh, of professional YouTube creators are are speaking out about, hey, this is actually this is stressful if you do it for for an extended amount of time, and it, it is taking a toll in one way or another. Yeah, I just I just I felt like I was at that point too. At, at some point, I'm, I'm I'm getting there, but it's yeah. Yeah, at some point, you have to treat it as a uh, as a, as a company, as a job, and and mm. just say okay video production is not going to be something that i have to do mm-hmm. so yeah i don't know where i'm going with this really but <laughs> uh i, I yeah. think i think it was yeah. a good move for you to kind of move out and have the possibility to maybe hire somebody at some point yeah. who can do the grunt grunt work for you that you can focus on the things where you are good at and where you can really put value in your content and also on the other hand when you go home at night um it is home it's not like you're running back to your printer checking prints or just finishing that stuff until it's like one o'clock in the morning no home is where you can relax and think about other things and do things that you enjoy besides of 3d printing video making and, and and stuff like that so it, this is also something which is sometimes hard for me in here because I live in the next room to where I'm currently recording. Uh, so, yeah, it is it is hard to really say, okay, I'm done for today because you always think about stuff. You can always go back and check check on your prints. But um, I don't know. Work is never done, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if I would be able to handle something like uh, having a, a separate studio at, at the point where I'm currently at, especially because I still have a normal work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess, I guess we, we also, <laughs> I think we, we, we quickly talked about like a regular employment, um, last time where my, my former employer just shut down the plant that I used to work at. Uh, uh, yeah. With with how much shutting down the the Straubing plant, like uh, I, I think we, we we talked about like I, I don't know what's going to happen to engineering, but uh, 
yeah, that was a job that I worked and that I never really found fulfillment in. I mean, I, I think I think I was good at it. Uh, I mean, I, I did project lead in the end, and I was like, uh, okay, I guess I'll do this now. And it, I did the best that I could, and it kind of worked out. But I was, I was like, uh, I'm not making a difference here. This is just mm-hmm. feeding the machine. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. It, it all has its ups and downs. Um, I think. I'm I'm in a very fortunate position to to be able to make this work, but it's not uh, it's not trivial. We we talked about this briefly before we started the stream. <laughs> uh, I'm not a game streamer that just uh, plays a video game for 15 minutes and uploads that recording. Though to be fair, it's probably more work than it sounds uh, for <laughs> for video game uh, YouTubers. But uh, yeah, we we chose this. We we did this to ourselves. Yeah, at least I did. You you still have uh, <laughs> you still have that way out. <laughs> Oh well, but we're happy with what we do, at least to some extent. Otherwise, I guess so. I, I wouldn't be doing it. We're not yet yeah. millionaires, but yeah. So <laughs> probably enough depressing talking, or I don't know how to call it. But I, I guess, I guess. Uh, let me let me finish this off with, with one last thing. So I, my video production, I've I've so far I've all done it in house. I think I've had. Well, I've had one video edited remotely by uh, by Preston Press Reset. Um, I've also tried a, a few other remote editing things with other people, but in the end, I always feel like sending stuff out for editing is more work than just editing it myself, especially with the workflow that I run, where I shoot my my A roll reading off my script first and then add b-roll I, I, I actually watch back my video and go like okay i need this shot this shot this shot that just doesn't work with having a remote editor um and preston Preston said is good at what he does i i just don't know if, if it fits in with with the way i work um so if any of you are students whatever looking for a part-time job and not full-time but like a part-time video editing writer production thing or even just a you know 400 years a month uh, mini job whatever if and if you're from the area uh which is the uh, lower bavaria dinglefing area uh send me an email you can you can find my emails uh, on the website so if you think you have something to bring to the channel let me know let me know maybe we can work something out cool yeah i know the thing is that right, right now I, I, I can use everything <laughs> i just i just want i just want to be able to say okay you yeah. do this and at the end of the day i can i can put myself in front of the camera and present it and yeah cool let's move on <laughs> let's move on sorry for for taking up uh, unplanned topics no worries sorry for, no for worries. taking up so much so much time yeah. there um so we got a couple of questions, questions. um first one Stefan. by ts 3d prince stefan i was wondering if there's a way to do accurate fea simulation for 3d printed parts if so what software works i can answer that do that yeah, 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 you can do it as long as you, you're only talking about resin prints. <laughs> <laughs> totally fine. And also, uh, DMLS, direct metal laser centered parts, yeah. are easier to do FEA simulation on. If you're talking about FFF or FDM 3D prints, it's hard. And I have been researching that topic in the past and there is as far as i know and if anybody knows something different uh, please let me know i don't think there is a software out there who can do really proper fea simulation on 3d printed parts um i think we've we've covered this topic before and what we what we always ended up with is it just it's just too much computational uh, effort to to do it because you did have to simulate like the interface between every layer to the to the next one um just to, to get something usable um i wouldn't say that it's too much computational war effort um the problem is the link between your print head moves and the finite element part. This has been done in in research papers before that you kind of map your print moves on your FEA mesh and kind of do a homogenized approach of the infill structure and 
don't model like each move on on its own apply um anisotropic material properties and things like that yada yada um but as far as i know there isn't a software out there who, where you can just like slice apart import g-code and then do fea simulation on that i hope that fusion 360 will implement that in the future because as far as i know they are working on a slicer implementation inside of fusion 360 and that would give them the tools to exactly do that yeah though again I, so the the way you're seeing this work is actually not with a with an uh quote an accurate fea simulation uh as as requested it's 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 really as any fea simulation is going to be uh it's really an approximation with reasonable amount of detail so uh you're not going to have a mesh for every single layer uh you're really just going to have one mesh that has material properties applied to it yeah um yeah because then it would be too much yeah. computational effort. And if you're taking, for example, a look at process simulation software that is widely used in metal 3D printing to simulate the, the thermal stresses and the warping during manufacturing, they also do the same approach. They also just approximate the final part and it's good enough, 90% there, 95, 99% there to get the proper result, but um, it, you can do the simulation in a reasonable amount of time and i would i would also see a same approach being feasible for fdm 3d printed parts that you do yeah. that you just mesh your part mesh your volume in the normal way as you would just mesh any isotropic material and then kind of import your g-code and then merge your g-code with your mesh and then map the G code commands and like the result of how much material is at certain locations to your FEA mesh. Yeah, yeah. Well, infill is, is still going to be that that tricky edge case because infill is not. I mean, it, it's going to behave differently if it's just a averaged uh, mm -hmm. volume in there instead of having the actual traces. But yeah. it's probably going to be close enough. Yeah. Now, what what I've been seeing a lot. Um, I don't know if you if you follow too many papers on YouTube. Yep. Um, no? no. Yes. Well, I did yes. in the past. I I have to be honest. I think I didn't watch his videos for like one or two years now. It's just two minutes per video. <laughs> ah, it was no. at the beginning. It was at the beginning. <laughs> no, it's not anymore. <laughs> um, but now YouTube just keeps keeps recommending to them to me every now and then. Um, and what he what one of his core things is is like neural networks and machine learning and, and all that and approximations for like fluid simulations which apparently if you have a mixed medium of uh, like water and sand or if you have foam on the top which has been one of the most recent ones mm. uh, that he presented it's it would be so much effort to accurately simulate it but you can get a a result that is convincing enough to the human eye in that case um to pass as the real deal so i wonder if there's a a way of doing like the uh the, the simulation for filament based prints that is close enough to the real deal because i mean th th there are always uh, variations in an mm. fdm print especially in an fdm print uh, compared to resin or, or dmls um that yeah it's not always going to be perfectly on point but it's going to get close enough to give you a really good idea of where this part is going to fail with the printing parameters that you're using. Yeah. So that that maybe can be a, a nice intermediary solution before we get like real down to the to the molecule simulation of uh, of FDM prints. Mm. Yeah, might be. Um, I just recently talked to somebody who maybe might come up with something like that otherwise yeah so what i usually do is um if you know how thick your walls are and you know how much infill you have you can uh, just hollow out your part and apply different material properties to your 3d prints um, to get at least the stiffness behavior kind of in the direction but uh, then stresses you would really need to to evaluate in um, 
the way that the printing orientation is at that point. So it, it's hard. And uh, this is also one of the reasons why I say if you use 3D printed or FDM 3D printed parts for critical applications, use a high amount of safety factor because otherwise yeah. um, it's just too unpredictable. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Next question from TSK Tech N. Would it be possible to read the MKS Servo 42B or your advice on the setup upgrade from Standard Lima 17? So, uh, MKS Servo 42B. Uh, I don't have one. You don't have one? Nope. What it is is a combination of a stepper driver, a Enco, I, I believe it's an encoder. Yeah, it must be an encoder. Uh, an encoder and a stepper motor as a unit. So basically, you get a, a dummy board that you plug into your Pololo uh, receptacle on your main board. It has a cable feeding out, um, I think, power also. Uh, but definitely step direction enable. And then the actual motor control happens on that driver board that's backpacked onto the NEMA 17 motors. So um, what that does is it runs the stepper motor as a servo. So it does uh, loss, if if I'm not mistaken here, it does loss step detection. It does, um, well, basically the way a servo works is if it, if you've ever played around with one, um, you tell it to go from A to B. And if you, for example, stop it anywhere in the middle, um, it's just going to pause there. It's going to push up against you. And then as soon as you let go, it's going to finish its move to B. It's basically a more robust way of doing motion. Um, servos have some trade-offs. They're always going to have some l delay um, to them because they, they're, they're, they're a feedback loop that basically you give an input, the mm. desired position and the actual position, and it, then, it, then it tries to ramp up speed. It's basically a PID loop that, that does that. Um, it's going to have some minimal delay. It's not, it's not a lot. And it's going to add cost. But in this case, it's actually quite cheap. Yeah, um, it's around 20 bucks what I have found on, on AliExpress. Um, so yeah, both of us haven't used it before. Uh, I, well, coinc coincidentally backed a, a Kickstarter a couple of weeks ago, which is called Ananas, Ananas Stepper, uh, Pineapple Stepper 3.0, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is also um, the same thing. You have a stepper motor and in the back an encoder and stepper motor driver uh, which might be cool for for some applications with the downside that that Tom just mentioned um, the thing where I want to apply it is on my CNC router because I just had issues with lost steps and then crashes due to that um, and I hope that this might be able to solve it the thing is um, each of the servos are acting on their own so if that one of true. them lacks or one of them is is not on step and tries to compensate for that the others don't know they will just continue uh, and for this reason there will still be printing artifacts if a crash like that happen but um, it should usually compensate for like a whole shift of, of your 3D print. Yeah, it's it's going to recover. It's going to recover. Um, yeah. If you are taking a look at like professional applications where stepper motors are used, there is probably one like main computer that is monitoring all of all of the access. And if one lags behind, it also tries to like stop the others that everything still stays in sync. Um, this won't be this won't be possible with like the the individual units, but it might be well usable for some applications. Though, in the end, I don't know if you have a properly tuned three D printer. Um, I don't know. I, I I rarely have really lost steps in my three D prints. So the question yeah. is if it is the right tool to compensate for a badly tuned 3D printer to apply stepper motors. Uh, yeah, to, 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 oh, to use servos. Uh, sorry, yeah. to use servo motors. Now, from, 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 from my experience, basically, if you look into any like consumer goods, um, say a 2D paper printer, um, 2D paper printer mostly runs on servos. Um, so the, the printhead XY 
that's a server. I think the paper feed might be a stepper. Yeah, paper feed definitely is a stepper in most machines. Um, but like the XY head is a servo. Why? Because it's cheap, it's fast. Um, yeah, it's cheap and it's fast. <laughs> it's precise enough. Um, the thing is also you can, if you if you build them on a large scale, you can actually deploy servos a lot cheap more cheaply than steppers mm. uh, for example in that printer tool head uh, x not xy it doesn't have a y axis uh, on the x-axis of of your 2d inkjet printer tool head um, it's just a, a small brushed motor and that that what's it called that ribbon yeah that had basically lines printed on it i think yeah um the that that you're kind of losing that advantage of cost with the uh, what was it called the MKS servo forty two B, and you're also losing that advantage of power and 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 and, and torque basically because you, they're still using a stepper motor and are basically just compensating for the mm. for the mistakes the stepper motor makes. If you have an actual well, brushless motor or something, they can pack. Um, so be because of the way that they are being commuted, or commuted is that the word? Whatever. The way they're being driven by the by their drivers is you usually get a lot more power out of a, a proper brushless motor uh, at the same size than you get out of a stepper motor, simply because of like the way they work. But you don't get holding torque. Is that in, in if, what? if if you have a brushed motor? A brush. You do get holding torque. Do you do you get uh, holding torque? Yeah. Well, it, here's the thing: you don't get like natural holding torque. Okay. Um, you get um, the driver sees a deflection. Yeah. And then it applies current okay. in, in the appropriate direction. And that, yes, that makes the server a bit flexible mm -hmm. because you always you always need that position deviation yeah. to actually get any torque output. But it's the same on a stepper motor. If you have a 200 um, pulses stepper. Mm -hmm. If it's just at the center position, you can wiggle the shaft around yeah. and you only get full torque once you're, I think, half a step or a full step. Okay. Full step, I can never remember. As soon as you get that that deviation, then the stepper motor actually produces torque. If okay. it's in its stand still, obviously, if it would produce torque, the shaft would rotate. So okay. it doesn't do anything. So it's it's not that much of a of a downgrade. It's just, yeah, by using a step, by still using a stepper motor, you're kind of losing out on some of the advantages that a, a real brushless motor would have. Now, there are some drive modes by um, Trinamic. I think it's DC step or some other modes that you can run a stepper motor like a brushless driver, mm -hmm. or like a brushless motor. Um, but it's still not as um, not as good as a proper brushless driver okay. as far as I'm, I'm aware. So, yeah, I don't know. Well, I hope to receive my servo motor um somewhere in summer this year even though um the, the kickstarter was by spark maker and they don't really have the best reputation for delivering on their kickstarters <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh so yeah and uh if it's working out for my cnc router I'll, I'll definitely post a video about it because i i think for something like that it might be a really nice upgrade here a question though if you have step loss on a cnc router you're still screwed i'm still screwed but i <laughs> well it, it depends if i just lose like usually when i lose steps on my cnc router then just the movement on one axis just because for example the acceleration was too high the axis yeah. just doesn't move anymore until there is a direction change again so i'm totally out mm. of totally out of location i hope with that servo motor i might just in the beginning lose like a couple of tenths of a millimeter or a millimeter or something like that so that my tool is not crashing directly in the well you, head on you're into still the gonna nick your part yeah um, definitely, probably definitely. If, it, if it's the wrong direction yeah. you're still gonna see it yeah, it might not completely snap off the tool, but yeah. uh, I don't know if it helps. It's, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not it's not an end all solution. Let's no, uh, definitely. Let's leave it at that. Yeah. Um, for three D printers, so just to, to answer the question, yeah. I guess uh, for three D printers, I I mean for most printers, it doesn't really make sense to use servos because stepper motors are plenty reliable. Um, for something like I have behind me, the uh, Formbot Raptor, which is a piece of absolute steaming garbage, um, 
it would make a difference because it's using that massive aluminum slab for a heated bed and it starts it's just constantly losing steps um for that it would work they would definitely make a make a difference and make the printer more usable but um yeah for a normal machine i there are other ways to to fix step loss like not going as crazy fa fast and uh, i mean if, if you still motors. have step loss a bigger yeah bigger motors better drivers um and if you're still going so fast that you're losing steps you're still gonna have issues uh visible issues in the prints mm. so <laughs> it's better than than, than completely shifting a print yeah so yeah it's it's not a solution for everything um Prusa, yeah. for example, they use the the Trinamic drivers that have stall guard, yes. the stall guard, and they notice when a step is lost and they will rehome the printer and continue printing. That yep. is a solution which is easily implementable, probably. Uh, sort of, yeah. I mean, Firma needs to support it. I don't know if uh, Vanilla Marlin supports that at this point, but yeah it's just it's mm. a new driver that's smart enough it doesn't work in all conditions but it's much better than not having it okay and it doesn't work if you use stealth chop that is correct yeah. yes so there's a trade-off a uh a a silent printer or a printer that has lost step detection well, I mean, it's not like spread cycle on the on the Trinamic drivers is loud. No, it's not loud, means. but it's, it's it's noticeably louder. <laughs> yes, yes, but it's it's still quieter it's still than, than an Allegro driver. Yeah, or, definitely. Or, yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay. Right. One last question for today. We're already at the one and a half hour. We're nearing the one and a half hour mark. Whew. Ah, so that that is a continuation uh, of last episodes topic of printing with the lightweight pla uh from <laughs> portion to pardon <laughs> is is that a <sighs> whatever um has two comments first it might be possible to create a stiffer wing for the airplane without a dual extruder you could use modifiers like the pressure slicer to lower the temperature on the inside structure so let's let's start with that one. Can you use modifiers for temperature? I don't. I don't think so. Uh, the problem yeah. in in uh, Prusa slicer is that um, you can't vary temperature um, on separate parts. And I think so. Um, I tried in one of the last releases. I think it's also not not working for for modifiers. I'm so I'm I'm just thinking about like how could you. Even if you can't do right click add modify or right click add modify and then property temperature, you could probably tell that it's a dual extruder setup and just have it do a, a tool change without actually removing or uh, uh, yeah. retracting any filament yeah. and then tell it, okay, it's a different filament yeah. that I'm loading into extruder two. No. You could probably make it work that way, but also the temperature changes are probably not fast enough yeah to do like a little spar on the inside that uh mm. is fully extruded or if not non-foamed yeah. i think we already talked about that in the past because yeah. i made the video about um multi-grade color color grading 3d printing something something where i with wood fill with wood right. fill with yeah. wood filament um and i had to use a pretty big purge block because it takes quite a while to change the temperature and then you still need to purge out all of the material that is for the foaming material already foamed up or not foamed up yet so um i think it's not really a, a feasible approach uh, at least if you don't want to purge like a ton of material yeah just just a just a, a thought here I, I guess it would be really cool to have like a topology optimized support tree in the center of the wing that's uh non-foamed and then just print the regular airfoil uh, just just thoughts <laughs> <laughs> just random thoughts i i still want to yeah. use oh i still would like to really try the um foaming material on a proper dual nozzle 3d printer to do things like that yeah. combining that but we'll see um i hope to to get that video out in in a couple of weeks and maybe after that there might be opportunity to to also work on that nice yeah and then the second part of the question uh thanks stefan for the by the way is it stefan or is it stefan uh, it's 
Stefan, but I always feel kind of weird putting that into an English sentence. So yeah, I, okay, I think I you're the crap, only so. one who's, who's really produce, uh, producing, pronouncing it properly. Oh, properly. Okay, thank you. So <laughs> uh, thanks, Stefan, for the tip to change the Ultimaker Bowden tubes. I have issues at the moment with under extrusion on my Ultimaker S5 is at work after one year of usage and over a thousand hours of print time. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> I also just purchased uh, uh, new Bowden tubes for our S5 at work because same issue. But And there aren't, I think Bowden tubes for the S5 aren't available or yet as a, as a replacement part. Are they like a special size or something? No, they aren't, but they're horribly expensive. I think you pay for the 70 centimeter Bowden tube for uh, an Ultimaker 3, 35 euros. Like, isn't it, isn't it just a regular PTFE tube? It's, it is, it is. Um, um, that's, that's... It's one quarter of an inch on the outside and 3.2 millimeters on the inside. Okay. Yeah. So that, that, that shouldn't be that hard to find. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We play yeah. some parts, obviously. Uh, yeah. Pulsion zu Poden, by the way, Monty Python. Okay. Did not know that. Live of Brian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's been a while since I've last seen that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. And I think I guess that's going to conclude the episode for this time for this. For, for not I keep wanting to say month, but we, we're doing we're hopefully doing more than one episode a month. Yeah. <laughs> Need to get back on track. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Thank you for your time. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you all in the next one. You can support us on Patreon, YouTube memberships, or all the other means that we have listed on our websites. Uh, again, thank you all for your support. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. See you. Bye.